Hi everybody, um, hello and welcome to today's session. Um, we have a amazing opportunity today to listen to two very knowledgeable people. Um, so we've got Callum, um, who's a GB uh, under 24 and women's coach. Uh, he's got a whole whole load of things in his uh, background. Frisbee, got smog, uh, playing GB himself. Um, and uh, Rupal, who's a GB's women's play GB women's player, um, and been in many GB cycles for that. Uh, both very very knowledgeable people, and we have the opportunity to listen to them talk about. Um, today we're doing defense. So um, if I hand it over to both of them. Hello, I'm here. I'm here. Cool. Um, Thanks so much for that introduction. <laughs> um, I've decided to start from the middle of my presentation, which is cool. Let's go from there. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for the very nice introduction, uh, Hannah. Me mm -hmm. and Roops are here to uh, talk about defense. And just so you know how this has happened, because Hannah is an absolute gem. Mm -hmm. um, and she messaged a lot of people in the GB Women uh, group and wanted to know if anyone wanted to talk about some different subjects. So here we are. I was um, assistant coach for um, GB Women 2018 and 19, 19 and 20, 19 and 20. That's how years work. Um, and yeah, like Hannah said, uh, under 24 mixed. Um, for a couple of years. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about um, some strategy things um, and Roops is going to uh, fill in with some um, individual things. So let's get started. Defense. Um, it feels like a lot of the time in Ultimate when we're talking about strategy um, we talk about offense all the time and everyone's obsessed about offense and to be fair the aim of the game is to score a lot of points, not achieve a certain number of turnovers. So that is kind of understandable. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be said for defense. Um, if you have questions um, that you want me and Rupal to answer, um, if you can put them in the training events um, thread, maybe that's that's the best place for it. Yeah. Um, I'm full screen at the moment, so I can't read them um, right now, but i um, get around to that a little bit later. All right, so defense, what's the point? Okay, this is a rhetorical question. I don't want you to unmute and say anything. I want you to just take a moment to think. What's the object of, of defense in Ultimate? What's the point? What are we talking about? What does this mean? Okay, actually do, actually do think about it. Yeah, yes, you. Okay, so what's the point? There aren't any particular right or wrong answers, but here's what we're going to be talking about. Disrupting the offense, okay? Because turnovers are great and everything. Turnovers are wonderful, but as you progress to higher levels of the game, which indeed we're hoping you do, okay? If people want to play um, under 24 level or internationally, um, turnovers become harder to come by. And so then we have to think about the purpose of our offer. Oh, the purpose of our defense is to disrupt the offense. We want to cause trouble for the offense, and that means on a macro, so very big, and a micro, um, individual scale. So on the macro scale, we've got strategy and we've got tactics. Already, I know there's probably one person there who knows the difference between these two, but in case um, you're not on there. Um, strategy is what you want to do. It's your overall aim. For example, stop them hooking. Use our athletic advantage. Okay, strategy is a high level overview, and it's often quite woolly. It's just a, a general, a general idea. Tactics are the specific actions you do to achieve your overall aim. So play zone, play FM, push players under. Okay, this is important. Okay. Why is it important? Because sometimes your strategy is right, okay? Sometimes you do need to stop them hooking, but your tactics are wrong or they've been done poorly, okay? So you might say, um, we need to stop them hooking. So what we're going to do is we're going to force FM and then they just 
hook across the pitch, okay? Your strategy is correct, but maybe instead of playing FM, you need to do something else like playing zone or um, pushing players under with individual match things. So your strategy is overall high level aim and tactics is the specific thing um, that you do to achieve your aim. And you can use lots of different tactics to make your strategy work out. Some examples of strategy, screwing up the other team's A game, okay? Forcing the other team to play a game that you're going to win, breaking the mentality of the other team, remaining unbroken yourself, staying positive, okay? If there's any anyone who's played the game Total War or has actually experienced Ultimate or Battle in general, um, it's a much easier, uh, the shortest way to beat someone is for them to beat themselves up, okay? Psychological warfare, you know? Um, we've all been there on a team where we feel really sad and everything's impossible and we suck and then we get bageled. And we've also been there where you've been playing on a team where you feel really great, you're super hyper, everything's going right, you feel invincible, and it's much easier to be energetic and to, to, get, all things, to get all that going. Okay, um, this is from this idea of um, mentalities mentioned in Sun Tzu's Art of War, if anyone's in, into the strategy reading. Um, and yeah, Sun Tzu was a bit of a dirty fighter. He was always like, do you know what? We need to do this in the quickest way possible. So instead of just having a massive war of attrition, what we're going to do instead is we're going to just try and break the other um, team's mentality as soon as possible. So they give up and they leave and they, they run away. Um, so that is a really important concept in, in Ultimate is um, that actually like weaponizing positivity. Um, so it's important to try to make the other team sad while remaining positive yourselves, okay? How do you do that in a spirited way? Well, just relentless positivity for yourself. Um, if you can keep your, your own team pumped up and hyped, um, then that's going to wear on the other team eventually. And if they are not doing that, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to drain them. Um, cool examples of tactics so in order to fulfill the strategy of screwing up the other team's a game cause chaos change the force so if they're really good with a flick force um give them backhand okay play fm never lose the game without trying a bit of fm transition defense so playing zone for like seven passes and then doing something else um or doing fm up to half and then going one way um, and play zone even if not windy, okay? If the only thing that you take away from this session is that you should play zone even when it's not windy, um, that should be it. Because everyone is good for a little a little choke on, um, on a zone, okay? And zone, like, plays into that. So for forcing the other team to play a game that you're going to win, you put your best defenders on their best offenders, okay? Does, it's not rocket science, but it's really important, particularly at kind of university level, where you've both got a finite number of really great players. If you can, if your best players can dominate their best players, then like you're probably going to win. Okay, that's that's it. If they've got one handler who's really good and everyone else is terrible, then get good matchups on that person to win, basically. Okay, um, it's not rocket science, but it's really easy to forget to do that. Um, yeah, knowing their strengths is really important. You gotta you gotta know the team that you're playing, and that again happens quite a lot um, at uni level. And if it's like if it's a more athletic team than you, then just give them the zone, okay? Don't let them run around you and beat you in one to one coverage. Force feed them zone, and you know what? Maybe it's not going to work every time, but in my experience, the more athletic a team is, the less good they are uh, at ultimate the less cerebral they are, okay? It's the um, standlers are really good at zone, but um, you're running around, cut at people, less good. Um, breaking the mentality of the other team, being louder on the sideline, celebrate harder, okay? Celebrations are really important. Um, and do you know what? Just being positive and celebrating stuff can really wind up the other team because they're like, oh, that was a rubbish goal. Why are they even celebrating that? And then bam, 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 you're in their heads. And all you're doing is just being positive, okay? I'm not saying get up in someone's grill and shout at them, okay? That's, that's not the one. Um, just being positive, 
is really important for your team. Remaining unbroken yourself, stay positive even when difficult. Okay, it's really easy to say that. Um, yeah, and I think it's something that um, if anyone's a, a real gamer um, knows, it's much easier. Well, it's it's just hard to stay positive even when things are going bad. Um, when you this rows aren't working out, <clears throat> or if you just suddenly can't aim, it's really difficult to do that, and it just requires effort basically. Um, ABTA, always be touching appropriately. Um, just giving high fives to other people um, releases a bunch of endorphins and makes everyone super happy. That's why people are always high fiving and stuff. Um, so always be touching appropriately. Um, stick to the team strategy. Learn from errors and change future behaviors. Okay, this is important. Um, trusting your teammates is kind of like a summary of all of these things. Um, trusting your teammates is super duper 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 important. If you if there's no trust on a team, you're not going to get very far. If you doubt the leadership and the captains and the coaches, you're going to get into a um a downward spiral pretty fast, and you're going to lose a bunch of stuff. Um, if you trust your teammates and you put them in positions to succeed, um, even if you think they aren't going to succeed, either you're going to be right or they're going to do something amazing, and that's going to be really cool. Um, so always trust your teammates um, to have your back and they'll um, trust you to, to have theirs. Really important. Okay, Rupal is going to talk about some micro scale defense. Yeah, so we've kind of covered the macro stuff. So talking about strategy versus tactics. And that is all kind of on a team level. And as we mentioned, defense is it's a team job, right? Like you have offense, which is a team job, and then you have defense, which is a team job. But there are things you can do as an individual to kind of get ahead of the game. And I think one thing that's really important to sort of point out is that everybody has their own preferred style of playing defense, and that is absolutely fine. But there are some fundamentals that are key to playing good D, which you just need to kind of keep in mind. Um, so we'll just kind of go through some of those. So Callum, if you could hit next. So if we talk about defense on a micro scale, it's what you as an individual are going to do. And I'm all for kind of just, just, just doing what you feel is right. Um, but you've got to make sure that you apply that in the right way. So strategy and tactics, so everything on a macro scale, it doesn't work without you buying into it. So as Callum mentioned, if you don't trust the system, then your defense will fall apart. So trust, 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 trust. So many times I've played in a game where somebody feels like they need to poach and then that person ends up getting scored on because they haven't bought into the system. So you as an individual need to buy in or defense will fall apart. And that is so important when you get kind of higher up and even at like uni, middle of uni, top end of uni, you go play club, GB, whatever, you need to trust the system that you're playing in. Um, and as I mentioned, you need to make sure as an individual, you're taking the right approach. So don't be that guy. And we all know who we're talking about, who gets school deep all game because you haven't gone out and done the work that you need to do in order to make sure you're, you are being the best defender for your team, yeah? So know what system you're buying into and then make sure you're doing what you need to do to make that system work. So what can you, yes, you do? So the first thing is know what you're trying to achieve and that is sort of just knowing what your strategy or your tactic is. Yeah, so always have that in the back of your mind and then know how you're going to apply all the individual elements. So first thing, take away plan A. OK, so if you have a cutter that loves always coming under first then going deep, then cut that out. OK, body positioning. We always talk about it. Make sure you have the correct body positioning um, when you're marking up against your offender. Good footwork. Don't fall over. You don't want to be that person who you know, gets turned on the first cut and then ends up on the floor. Make sure you've got good footwork. Identify comfort and discomfort zone. So this ties into what Callum was talking about on a macro scale where you where you learn and adapt as the game goes on. And knowing the person that 
you want to mark up against. And if you mark up with them multiple times during a game, you'll find that that matchup just gets better and better and better. And it's because both of you are identifying what the other person is comfortable with doing and what the other person isn't comfortable with doing. And that is a whole different part of Ultima, right? Like that's what makes it so enjoyable is just being able to go out and grind against the person that's opposite you because, you know, you learn about each other during the game. Um, another thing on a micro scale is you always want to dictate the movement. Um, defense should be proactive, not reactive. Um, and that comes from dictating the movement. And then the final thing, which I think is a whole different discussion in itself, but is you need to know when to bait and to get a block or when to play containment D. And, you know, blocks are harder to get the higher up you go. And containment defense is so much more valuable because that's the team element. But as we'll see kind of later on, there there are times where like you need a block. So kind of just have it in the back of your mind is like, okay, is it time to go out and play red zone defense? Or right now, are we just trying to contain? So examples on how to build on each of those like each of these micro elements. So as we said, the overall aim, always keep the team strategy in mind. And I think that's potentially the key the key piece of advice like in this masterclass as Hannah so kindly titled it but defense it's not difficult it's it, defense is played between like between your ears it's, it's what goes on in your mind you could be the fittest person the fastest person the person with the best hops but if you're not playing as a team then defense is going to fall apart and and that is it, really. That is kind of the key thing about defense is you've always got to keep what your team is trying to aim for in mind. Um, so taking away plan A, does somebody like to do a jink move? There are some people who get free literally just by doing a shoulder shimmy. Identify it. Cut it out. OK, if somebody always likes to go deep first, then try to take away that as their first option. Force them to do something else. Body positioning. What do you like to do? Do you prefer to stand behind somebody or stand square on? So I quite like to stand behind um, stand behind my offender, so stand on their back shoulder, just because then I get kind of a view of what's going on. But you might prefer to be square on or you might prefer to be um, on their inside shoulder. But regardless of that, you need to make sure that you're present. Make sure you're offender knows that you're there put that pressure on them before they've even started moving and just you know making sure that they're aware that you're present given your body positioning is is really valuable because it sort of sets the tone for that point good foot good footwork go out and do your ladders go out and do your five ten fives there are so many drills that you can do to get better at footwork and the quicker that you can keep up with your offenders changes of direction the more effective your defense is going to be to a point where they're probably just not going to even bother moving because your defense is going to be so good. Yeah. So make sure you go out and make sure you practice, practice, practice your footwork, practice changing direction, um, practice, you know, go out and set a timer whenever there's a random beat, make sure you change direction. Um, so many things you can do as an individual to help be the best defender for your team. Um, identifying discomfort zones. Force handlers away from the disc into the pitch and get your cutters back towards the disc. You know, really simple concepts. Um, and, you know, if if you know you're marking up against a handler who doesn't really like to be downfield, try and stand behind them and force them downfield a lot more. So identify what your opponent's discomfort zones are and try and make them go into them. So dictate your movement. So Shakira, Shakira, use your hips. Um, and your shoulders to create an angle. And what we mean by this is you have a choice. You can either create a narrow angle for your opponent to go into, and you have to make sure you're set up in the right way. So you're dictating that movement right from the start. But if you maybe want to force them away from the disc, you know, you want to make them have to, you want to make your thrower have to throw a leading pass. And because you want your offender to have to run a little bit further set up in a way that makes them make that cut so have the cut you want your offender to make in mind and then adjust your defense so that you force them in that direction and that's a really valuable thing that takes a little bit of practice but the more you try it 
the more comfortable you become. And that just comes from, you know, going out and saying to the person you're matching up against, okay, I don't want you to go towards the disc. So I'm going to try and force you away from the disc and then measure up and, you know, see how successful you are in that. And then the final bit, bait or contain. So containment is key to team defense, but there's a time and a place for a big block, right? So there, there might be times where you think, oh, you know what, I want to go out and I want to get a run through D on this person. But say you miss that run through D, you're now lagging behind your offender and you haven't really gained anything. And now there's somebody free kind of streaking downfield. Was that actually the right time to try and get a run through D? Did you, did you force it or did it come naturally? Yeah. So play containment D until you feel like, you know what, my team, we need a block right now. You might be four points down, five points down and you feel mentality dropping. It doesn't mean that everybody needs to go out and try and get a big block. But if somebody generates a layout D or generates a huge sky, then something like that can really change a team's mindset. Um, but there's a time and a place for it. So being able to identify the time and the place um, as an individual helps you to become, you know, a top defender. So I noticed that we're kind of like a meme. There's a whole meme account. So to kind of summarize everything, be the girl on the on the right hand side. It is okay to still make two L's with your hands. I do it every time I'm on the pitch. My 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 ritual when I'm on the D line is I'll listen. I'll then forget the force. I will ask the other people on the line, what's the force? And then I'll make two L's with my hands and then I'll remember. But that's okay, okay? Making sure that you know what the force is, what the overall aim is. Even if somebody needs to tell you two, three times, that's fine, as long as you know it. Don't be the guy on the left-hand side who gets told the force is home, but actually force is center, okay? So if we're doing anything on a micro scale, just make sure, you know, you do you. Make sure you do what you find comfortable, but make sure whatever you're doing ties in to the overall team aim. So the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to run through um, a few models. So we've gone and we found a few clips um, of some really good defense. Some people might look a bit familiar. Um, and... We're just going to go through them and kind of say, OK, what's the ideal? Where do we think we are now? And how are we then going to reach the ideal? So the first one is an example of bait versus contain. So hopefully the link you'll be able to hear from the link. They're still keeping some nice. Oh, oh my word. OK, so to just add a bit of context, the ideal here, you can see the score is 6-1. Okay. So what we needed, so this was our opening game of Worlds um, in Perth, and we needed a block. So managing to identify, okay, pre preempting, the throw is going to go to this place. How can I set myself up to get a block on this throw? So we played containment D, but it was the right time to bait and try and get a block on that. The block pays off. And we actually go and score the point. So if we had been, say, 6-1 up, probably wouldn't have bothered trying to get that block because it, it wouldn't have added anything at the time. So containment D would have been a lot better. But because we're 6-1 down and it's kind of embarrassing at this point, um, it's definitely the right time to bait. OK, so that is the ideal. But where do we feel like we are at now? All of us, myself, Callum included, will at some point have gone to get a block and missed it due to timing, okay? And if you miss that, as we've talked about, there's, there's then a free man, and it definitely probably wasn't the right time to go and try and bait it. So this means that your defense has had less impact, okay? So being able to identify the time to go and get a block is what we need to work on. So to reach that ideal of knowing when to bait versus when to contain means keep practicing reading the game, okay? Little rhyme there. But when, when you're out and when you're training or when you're watching Ultimate and you see somebody go like a fly by D and if they miss it, 
think to yourself, was that the right time? Try and identify those times. And as well as that, find a niche. What are you good at? So for me, that is the type of block that I'm good at, po- poaching off and getting a block on the handler. Whereas some other people might be really good at forcing somebody to go deep and then going to get in a huge sky, you know? Find out what your niche is and learn the right time to apply that. Yeah, in, in case people uh, are unaware of who Rupal is, that's that's her getting the block there. Just just in case anyone didn't didn't realize. Um yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the next one we're gonna talk about is body positioning. So if we go to the link. So we're watching the that block there. And if anybody doesn't know who that is, that is Hannah. Um, So what we want to talk about here is Hannah's body positioning. So if we go back slightly, one thing I want you to notice is which side of her offender she stays on after this point. Okay. So here we can see she's on the inside shoulder. So she, throughout the entire cut, she maintains that, that inside body positioning. And... One thing at this point, okay? So let's hold it here. What you'll notice is Hannah has turned and her body is facing towards the disc. Well, she can at least see the disc. Often when we play, we can fall into the habit of kind of just chasing our offender around, but that often means we're on their back, like that we are basically just, we're just chasing them, right? We're on their back shoulder. But one thing here, which Hannah does really well is maintain that inside lane So she's kept her body between her offender and the disc, which has allowed her that inside lane, okay? So what we can see, she keeps that, she keeps facing the disc. She's kept that inside lane, which lets her go and get this sick block. Okay, and that's a really good example of how keeping your body positioning, while it wasn't necessarily that her hips are square or that her shoulder was on the inside lane her the way her body's positioned on the inside of her shoulder for the entirety of her offender's cut means that she's able to get her team that block so that is the ideal where are we at now sometimes as i mentioned we allow our defenders to get inside of us and that's because we don't always turn inside. So on that clip, Hannah actually turned away from her offender to maintain that inside lane. Often we turn to face our defender, um, to face our offender. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but thinking about how you turn, you, you don't always need to keep your offender in your in your eye line if you know where they've committed their cut. It, it it's risky but it pays off like it does there. So sometimes we need to make sure that we're we're maintaining the same lane um, and we're not just chasing our offender around. And while it takes practice um, and, you know, you need to use your peripheral, you need to make sure you're turning very sharply, which is where the footwork ties in. um, We want to reach the ideal of being able to maintain our position against our offender. Um, So making sure that we stay on the same line um, and force our offender in a desired direction means that we'll then be able to generate um, good defense for the team. So what can we do to reach that? So how do we reach that ideal? Practice maintaining that inside buffer and that inside lane, as we saw in that clip, is it's a really, really valuable path to stay on. So, you know, practice turning both away from and towards your offender while maintaining the same buffer, you know? Don't let that buffer close. And in that clip, the the distance between Hannah and her offender didn't actually change that much, despite the fact that her offender changed direction because she maintained that inside buffer. So going out and kind of practicing, maintaining that distance um, is how you reach that ideal. And then the final one for me um, is taking away plan A. So on this link, keep an eye on the guy that just scored. So if we go back, 
we'll set it up, okay? So just pause it here. So Callum is actually marking the guy on the disc. So he's got the force on. His thrower then throws the disc and is immediately, you can tell by his body positioning, is looking to get the give go. So what does Callum do? He adjusts himself and goes and gets that inside lane and gets the block and a Callahan. In fact, happy days. So one thing which Callum did really well is he identified that the movement that his offender wanted to do was that give go. So you can see as soon as his thrower has thrown, Callum goes with him. So he's literally matched up pace for pace against his offender. Goes, he's taken away plan A and he's gone and, go, and gone and got a block because he identified what his offender wanted to do. And that's not always easy, but you can see at this point they've played eight points. So he's had time to see what their strategy is and what they're looking to do for what they're looking to do when they're on offense. So if he's seen them do give goes from that position multiple times, he knows, okay, next time they do that, I know I need to take away that give go. And then you go get a Callahan. So that's the ideal. Where are we now? Potentially we're not able to adapt to defense. Um, we're not able to adapt our defense to offenses on the fly. And that it comes from practice, but that's where the sideline comes in really useful. So it sounds really cliche when you say that the sideline is the extra is the extra man on the field, but they, they really are. And you can see so much from the sideline and being able to identify, okay, I noticed last point they, they did this. So let's try and change our defense and being able to change your defense as a team and as an individual, it makes you a really, really powerful team because it makes you quite well, well-rounded. You know, we have lots of offenses in our back pocket and Callum mentioned right at the start, often we go out and we train lots of different offenses, but where you become an elite team is if you're also able to change your defense, because if a team goes out one point plays vert, next point plays ho, next point plays weave, what else is there? ISO. If you're able to adapt your defense, not just between points, but during the point, then that makes it very, very difficult for the other team. And that's that positivity we're talking about. It gets in the other team's head if you're able to shut them down. So being able to adapt your defense on the fly um, really helps to take away that plan A. And while it means you have to think a little bit more, it's really, really valuable. So how do we reach that? You've got to play with your mind and not just with your legs, you know, tuning in in your head and not just physically. Um, while it is super exhausting, that is what you have to do at higher levels. You know, ask anyone who's played Euros, played Worlds. You, it's exhausting, not just physically, but mentally, because you constantly have to be thinking. And that is the next step to becoming um, an elite defensive team. Cool. Um, so the next little bit we're going to do um, is talking about containment D. Um, I am not um, a I'm not the springiest defender. Okay. That's not me. I do, however, try to think quite a lot. Um, and so I tend to play a lot of containment D um, because that makes sense to me uh, and from the way that I see it. I'm like, do you know what? They've got 10 seconds to throw the disc. If we just make sure that they can't complete one pass, then then we're good. We've just got to play defense for 10 seconds. Um, so I've got an example of some containment D. Um, and now this is from WCC, so the World Ultimate Club Championships, um, where I was playing with Smog. Um, I'm playing on the D-line, and we're playing against Seattle Mixtape. And if you know anything about Seattle Mixtape, they've got a guy called Brad Hauser, and what Brad Hauser does is he runs deep for goals. And I think um, I was one of the captains for the team. We had four captains. There was a lot of captains. Um, but I warned people to, to look out for Brad. Um, but sure enough, on the first point, Brad goes deep for a goal. Okay? And this is like... That's mixtapes A game, really. Like, how many passes have we have we made them throw? Okay, they've like they've dumped the disc once, and then bam, they're looking deep, uh, and 
It's a goal. That's it. Um, so we scored going the other way. In fact, let's 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 just see that because you know, small classic. We've got Tessa Hunt, GB mix Tessa Hunt, slang in deep to GB mixed Rachel Turton. Oh yes, suck it mixtape. Um, then next D point. Um, I am marking with my very green socks. I'm marking Hauser, right? And so what's the point of defense? We're trying to disrupt the offense. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stay deep. I'm going to be like, you know what, Brad? You can go under all you want, but you're not going deep, okay? So he gets to this there. I've got the force on, right? I'm picking. I'm like, um, sure, um, him going under is bad, but if I bite too hard on that, he's going to toast me deep. So I'm just going to try and contain. Um, that was potentially close to a block. Um, and then throughout this point, there's me and Brad. I'm staying slightly behind him, trying to know where he is. Okay, I'm just like, stay stay under Brad, stay under Brad. He absolutely does me with this move here. This is really clever, by the way. Sorry to talk about offense, We're nearly done. He just takes a step there, which makes me think he's going to run um, over to the break side. But he, surprise, he's running around there. So I'll drop the ball there. But I get away with it, it's all fine. And then trust my teammates, boom, goal. Not goal, turnover. Well, hey. Um, so that's an example of like containment defense of like what we don't want is for them to score in two passes, right? So I just need to do my job of stop this guy from getting into the end zone. So just doing boring things, trusting every trusting everyone on the team to do their jobs. And um everyone is playing like good individual defense like we've got pressure on them and then eventually um, we're able to to force a turnover because everyone's just in the right place on their players taking people away and uh there it is all right so we're taking away and we're challenging okay so the ideal thing is that you take away plan a and you make plan B really difficult, okay? Right now, maybe we're just trying to dominate everywhere. We don't have that plan in our heads. We're not like, we're just like, I'm just going to beat them. Okay, they're running over there. I'm going to beat them. I'm running over there. I'm going to beat them. And you can see like from that cut where I got a little bit too thirsty um, to, to chase after Brad. He did me with one little step and then he was probably free there. Um, so we've got to train in order to get to take away and challenge, you want to take away and give up, okay? We want to take something away definitely and give up the other thing. So we say, I'm going to stay deep of you. You can have under, that's fine. Or if you're playing a team where no one could throw, you're like, We're going to, I'm going to take away under, I'm going to push you deep. And then when you're getting really good at that idea, then you're going to try and take away and then challenge. So taking away one thing for definite and then challenging to take something else away. That's containing, containing D. Switching. Um, it didn't make these into hyperlinks. Sad. So this is um, a clip that involves me, but it's not actually me being good. Okay. What happens? I'll put the sound on for a second. This is me. Okay. My player is hugely free. Okay. And this is Carlo. Carlo's a great guy because he's playing smart defense. He's looking at the thrower. He's seeing this guy. So what Carlo does, um, you can hear it in a second. Yeah, that's right. I mean, even if you're not going to win a game, it's certainly a good... Okay. Carlo pointed... Carlo pointed to me and said, switch. Time to... Took that player. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I mean... Even... We're playing as a team. Okay. Carlo sees the threat, reacts straight away, and even manages okay. to communicate. So he covers to... that player. I'm left to cover this player. And Carlo's close to a block as a result. Fine, if... if Carlo had just left me, if Carlo was not such a, a great person, then I'm jogging on to put the force on. Maybe they're able to get a hook off. It's just a little thing like that really helps. Okay? And it's not just going in to get a block. Okay? The, the key thing is that um, he communicated the switch, and that really helped out. So what's ideal? Good communication. 
um, by under player. Well, in this case, it was the under player. You can do it the other way around. If Carlo's player was running deep, he could say switch to me, um, or I could say switch to him. So good communication. Where are we now? Maybe we're not recognizing moments where we can switch or we're not communicating. So we end up with two players marking someone else and it's all going a little bit crazy. Okay. It's very difficult to think about all of these levels because you might say, oh, look, there's a switch. But then you can't remember to turn your brain on and be like, switch and say say the words. You just recognize it. That's all right. Over time, you, you, come, to, um, you come to understand what, what's happening and you can articulate those words as it's happening. So you just get into the practice of communicating. So how do you get there? You make a conscious effort to talk. Okay. When you're on the pitch, you're like, I need to talk. I need to talk. Or you remind someone on the sideline and be like, tell me, tell me to talk. Okay. Shout talk at me all the time. Callum talk. Okay. Little things like that um, are the small incremental progressions that it takes to get real good. Cool. So strategy. Um, this is an example of using zone. Okay. So the context of this um, is it's GB women against Finland at um, the European Championships. And I'm calling the strats. And I decided to call zone on the last point. We just played a lot of match. They'd scored at like a lot of points using match. We hadn't really played zone, but my calculus was like, do you know what? We haven't given them a lot of zone. It's universe point. They're probably gearing up to play against match. So they're probably talking about what we're going to do. So we're going to give them zone and that's going to upset their rhythm. It's going to put their O in a bit of a weird spot. Okay. Um, and yeah, I feel like teams maybe don't use zone enough. Um, I think it's a good a good thing to do. Um, and so I'd recommend that people use zone more often. Okay. We're also going to talk about the success of the zone um, because Rupal was playing D on that point um, and pulling as well. So she's asked what the force is. No, she hasn't because it's it's zone, but she might know. Um, yeah, so Finland getting ready to play against match, and then boom, it's it's zone. A block straight off, okay. Just look at that from the from the micro level. And um, this is Lucy Hyde. She stays behind her player, and then just accelerates into the disc. And because um, her offender slows down, boom, that's a D. However, that comes back for a foul, so it's not that, it's not that easy. And now we are into the zone, OK? So Rupal is over here. And then just while we're enjoying my strategic brilliance, OK, let's also appreciate Rupal's amazing execution, OK? Because strategy is great, tactics are fab, but if you don't do them, it's rubbish, OK? And all of our zone defenders do a great job. Um, so Rupal is doing loads of things right, OK? So we're playing like an arrow head, so it's three at the front, three in, three in the middle, and one at the back. When it gets to the sideline, it goes a little bit more cuppy. Um, but it's mostly like an arrow. So what Rupal's doing is all the time she's looking around the pitch. She's not focused on the disc. She's looking at the disc, but she's also looking around to see where the threats are, and she's adjusting her position accordingly, okay? It's really valuable skill. She even manages to get in there on a block, okay? She anticipates what's going to happen next. She looks at the thrower, and then she's like, oh, oh, and then she sees this wind up, and, you know, that's a Rupal classic on the way. Um, thrower looks it off. We're back to containing. Someone calls injury, can't handle. And we're and we're just going, okay. Finland is is all over the place. They've they've definitely been rattled by this. They are looking really scared. Uh, we're playing great zone. We're just doing the fundamentals, okay? People are just looking around, taking away options, making it difficult. It's not windy, by the way. They've been hooking it all game. And we're just being patient. Everyone's just doing their job. We're grinding it out. 
remembering to get into into our shapes. They've been very risk averse, Finland. They're not going anywhere. It's real difficult. All our um, players are putting pressure on. And then before you know it, Finland decide to jam something in difficult. And boom, that's a turnover on universe point. And before you know it, goal. So that's kind of like the micro and macro coming in together. The idea of that was to upset um, the other team's rhythm, put them in a weird position. Okay, it's universe point. It's um, you just got to believe a bit in the choke. Everyone played really well, uh, which was great. Uh, but again, there's no, you don't need, you shouldn't call zone if you never practice zone or if you suck at zone because that's going to go badly. Uh, but how do we get there and be really great? Well, just like Rupal, you've got your head on a swivel, you're looking around, um, you're trying to get information about what is happening on the pitch, react to those threats, make life difficult um, for the offense. Just do your job. You don't need to be an absolute hero. Okay. In that point, it was definitely Finland had to figure it out, had to work it out. Um, GB, we were just doing our jobs um, and we um, got that turnover and won the game. Cool. Last one from me um, is Loose Women. And this is actually the same point that we saw earlier with Hannah. And this is um, a little bit of, of strategy for you. So using um, intelligence and um, thinking, we realize that we are playing GB under 24 against Germany under 24. We realized that they were playing a lot through their male players. Okay. So we thought we had to, we had to disrupt that. So we're playing loose women, which the idea is our male players are going to play um, match defense playing tightly like Felix here. Look at, look at him go. Go on, Felix. Um, and our female players are going to try to disrupt spaces on the pitch, okay? And they're not going to worry so much about marking tightly individually. They're more concerned about spaces. So this means that, in effect, we're kind of double covering male players and worrying less about um, female players. So as the point continues, this works well because Germany um, have got a lot of female cutters. So we've got people in positions to do work. So there's a pick somewhere. Okay, this comes back in. Hannah is not near a player, okay? She's in a space, which is really valuable, okay? Joe on the other side is in a space, okay? So we're, we're trying to clog up the space, make it difficult. So that up the line pass maybe doesn't go because... Um, Maybe not just because Felix is playing lights out defense, but also because Joe's already in that area. Okay. Ali is hanging out back. Um, of course, another bear. Um, Ali's hanging out deep just to make sure no one sneaks away. And this is real difficult. Okay. Because we are um, kind of counter stratting the other team. Hannah's out in this space. Joe's out in that space. Ali's out there. And it's really hard for them to see what's happening um, on the pitch. Then. Going back to the micro scale, Hannah makes a play, body on the line, gets a sick D. So what we wanted to do there was disrupt the offense. Okay. So we've got this poaching strategy, loose women. Um, so we're putting our female defenders out in spaces and getting our um, guys to mark tightly. And this is just to, you know, just disrupt, just show them something different. As a result, it goes pretty well. There's a foul. But they're, they're not really getting any big yardage, any big yards. Everyone's doing their job. And then in the end, it comes down to Hannah doing her job really, really well. But again, we're, um, we're trying to make sure that everyone's accounted for. Okay, so there are players here. Hannah's pulled in closer to to make sure that they can't get the disc easily. 
All right, so that's an example of like strategy making making your life easier. Um, and well, tactics making life easier. Um, little bonus clip, just gotta throw it in here. Um, this is from one of our other games. This is how to poach, okay? If you, if you are gonna do it. This is Nass, okay? And he gets a block. Pretty sick, right? But what's he doing? He's marking um, Dylan over here, but he's occupying this space really aggressively, okay? He doesn't want to leave unless he absolutely has to. Then when he does leave, he sees another threat coming in. So then he adjusts to that. Okay. He adjusts to it. And then makes a play. Okay. That's, he's not doing that because he's lazy. He's doing that because he's like, I'm going to occupy space on the pitch. I'm going to take this away from the other team. So when you poach, endeavor to do that more than just play really poor match D. All right. Yeah, so um, just to summarize on Loose Women, um, what we're trying to do with that particular um, tactic strategy, make it difficult for the other team to play through um, their men. Where we are now, if we try playing this, maybe you know, identifying danger areas uh, when playing it, or um, what happened a lot for us was um, men trying to do too much. They were like, I'm going to poach as well. Um, so just remembering to do your job. And then how do you reach that ideal? Listening to sideline feedback from captain or coach. Not, yeah. Um, I, not just anyone is ideal. Getting people who actually know what we're, what we're trying to aim for um, is really important. Just so we've got one voice um, providing a clear message to everyone. Okay, back over to RuPaul. Yeah, so the final part is kind of just a wrap up. So this is my favorite phrase to sort of go by when you're playing defense, because it's quite easy to cross the line. So when you're playing D and for ultimate in general, go by the saying, be confident, not cocky. And knowing where that line is will, one, help your spirit and Two, just mean that you play with the right swagger that you need to, to be that team who is always positive, like annoyingly so that it gets in the other team's head without crossing the line to being cocky. So whenever you approach ultimate defense in particular, just believe in yourself and have that confidence knowing, okay, I'm just going to do me and make sure that me plays into the team the team system. So go out on pitch, be confident in yourself, be confident and trust your team, but don't cross that line into being cocky because we've all played against a team that's been too cocky for their own good. And it just means that people don't like them. So yeah, when you're going out playing ultimate, have this in the back of your mind, be confident, but don't be cocky. Okay. And yeah, we hope you found that useful. So time for a quick Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions about anything to do with ultimate it doesn't just have to be defense just fire away um we'll read anything that has appeared um in the chat as well um but if you need to rush off because you feel so inspired by the things we've talked about you're going to write a new defensive strategy then uh, absolutely go and do that um or if you're just bored also you can um you can defo leave as well um, but yeah, have you got questions? Let us know. Uh, there was a question further up from Dan Wilson. <laughs> who He says uh, to Rupal, uh, what's the best way to bait a D? Uh, do you bait your offender or do you try and get a poached D? And maybe you answered it, but um, if you have any more to say about that. Uh, well, Dan, also a huge fan. Um, but I think... It depends on you. Like some people like poaching, as you saw in that final clip, whereas I like to just hang around my offender just a little bit and then go for it. But having a couple of things in your arsenal also isn't a bad thing. So my, my favourite thing to bait is that block on the dump, um, but also being sneaky, sneaky and getting a little hand in from behind to kind of pop round and get a block is also quite nice. So, yeah, depends on the situation. All situational. Cool. Thanks. I, I have a question. 
uh, whilst we wait for other people to type. Um, uh, how do you start going for layout Ds and do you have any advice for people new to this or like how did you get into it, uh, either one of you? Uh, I'd definitely ask for RuPaul's opinion on this. <laughs> um, hilariously, my first layout, I actually just completely stacked it um, and then thought, okay, that's not so bad. But I think the the first thing to kind of think about if you're going to go for a layout D is, is it safe? Because it's one of those things where if you execute it poorly, you could injure yourself, but probably like more importantly, you could injure your offender and they don't have a part to play in that move that you've just made. So assess the situation and think, if I'm gonna make this bid, is is it gonna be safe? Um, so that's the first thing to think about. But then I guess just practice, like there are plenty of things that you can do. So if you have a crash mat or if you have an old mattress, like practice going from your knees and getting a block, um, or just catch in. I would always start with learning how to lay out catch because the, there hopefully will be nobody else involved in that. Um, and yeah, start from your knees and progressively get a little bit higher. And then when you're going for a block, um, while it is useful to catch the block, um, just start by like trying to tap it away. Um, the difficult thing about layout Ds versus layout grabs is that sometimes you have to navigate around your player. So the if, if you feel like you want to do it, start by the poachy ones because they're in a bit more space. Um, but otherwise, you've just got to practice like navigating around things because sometimes you have to come around the back of a player or, you know, go with your trailing arm so that you don't cause any contact. Um, so, yeah, blocks are a little bit more difficult. But the, the main thing is, is make sure they're going to be safe um, because the last thing you want to do is is injure yourself or somebody from the other team when you're doing them. Yeah, I think having a team culture that encourages and reinforces laying out is also really valuable. So if you can um, get it to your team that it's that it's expected to like to to go for it, like when when that layout's there, like if you can really expect your players to do that, and if you always celebrate it, doesn't matter if the form is absolute garbage. You're always like, "Yo, it was a sick bid." Just show people that you appreciate um, when when they're putting their body on the line. Um, I think is really difficult to do but i think uh really rewarding thank you we have many questions coming in i don't know if you guys can see them would you like me to read them out um i can see some of them uh from dj 10 yeah one tip to give to players graduating from uni ultimate something you learned from playing club that you wish you had known earlier or a bad habit that most uni players seem to have thanks um roops any ideas yeah i'm i'm just trying to think so something you learned from playing club that you wish you'd known earlier okay the two are very different i think that's the main thing that stood out for me um is i was quite lucky to be able to play with emo while i was still at uni um so i could identify that difference quite early on but like just just keep in mind that uni, uni ultimate is great because you play so much of it but your body gets tired like even if you don't think you're tired you pro you probably are tired whereas with club you have a lot of time during the week to kind of relax and then put everything into your training sessions like I'm not sure what it's like at work but at Loughborough we used to train three to four times a week with uni and then once with emo and then we'd have something on the weekend so you're playing ultimate most most of the time whereas with club like just take the time to you know when you graduate and you go and play club just take the time to like start again and like build your body back up and just enjoy having like two training sessions a week and not having to play tournaments every weekend and really kind of fit into that club culture because it can be a bit of a shock sort of moving away and fitting into maybe a bigger club where everybody's really good um and you know you're not having to go to training sessions every single day you're not having to run things all the time I think one of my biggest tips is just enjoy playing club and you know take time to focus on an element that you maybe didn't get to work on so for me I worked a lot on my throwing um I went into uni like knowing how to play but 
my throwing was pants and I don't really think I improved my throwing at uni just because I didn't have time to kind of take a step back and go I'm going to forget about everything else and just going to learn to throw again because we were playing so often whereas after uni I was like okay now I have time to like teach myself how to throw again and I found that really valuable. Callum I'm not sure what you have. Um, I think at uni you don't realize how great it is to have people who want to play ultimate four times a week um so like after graduating it can be hard to get the regular training time in um so if you uh, yeah so as a result a lot of club players just kind of don't get any better after uni or like gracefully tail off because they remember what they still see themselves as that player who was training four times a week um and in reality that they're, they're just like stagnating um so I think really lean into your into your uni stuff, go to all the practices um, because um, it just becomes harder to get to those training things. And then just like lean into club as well. Like all the experienced players really appreciate keen beans. So if you're like always posting in the fitness group, like that gets noticed and they're like, whoa, they might be absolute trash, but like they're really keen and that's really valuable. Um, so I I do recommend like just throwing yourself into um into club stuff. Um, Graham underscore KP. During these months when we haven't been able to play frisbee, what have you been doing to stay motivated or keep skills up? So, um, that's really difficult. Um, and part of that is because um, what you what you kind of like saturate yourself in is like what you think about. Um, so it's really easy to think about Frisbee all the time when all your friends are Frisbee players and you're playing Frisbee every weekend because like you're just marinating in ultimate. Um, so I think something that's helped me with motivation to like go and train is just trying to marinate myself in ultimate. Um, so that's taken the form of watching like at least one ultimate game um, a week. Uh, which I've I've been doing with a friend, um, which is which is good for a nice little cycle of accountability, and um, because on on Thursdays that's what we do we 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 watch frisbee, um, cute little date, uh, so I think that's that's been really useful. Like following um ultimate accounts on social media is good for like just getting that thought process in there and being like oh sick people jumping and stuff oh I wish my body could jump a lot and then you motivate and then like boom, um yeah you're able to like keep going out there. Um, and then my club team smog has just got a training group sorted. Um, and so there've been a lot of fitness posts in there. So it's, it's really good to, again, feel like you're being held accountable to, um, to know that your teammates are out there on the ground. So you're like, I've got, I've, I should also do that, I guess. Um, yeah. Got, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much the same as Callum, like, with LED we've basically just created a group and it's not like everybody contributes because some people just want the time off because you know we had a few people who really wanted to go for U24s and then obviously that got cancelled so that it does it does hit hard but there are some people who are just like I can just do fitness now like I can just go and get better at running or get stronger so pe- kind of just tune in to what other people have wanted to do in this break Um, and it's okay if your goal changes um, as well you know it's it's okay if you want to get better at running 5ks rather than wanting to get quicker for ultimate but one thing that I found really useful is like thinking about the player I want to become for my team and working towards that so not necessarily working towards a specific tournament but working towards becoming better for my teammates so I think okay when I get back on pitch whether that be for LED whether it be for sick I want to be this much better as a player so working towards that and thinking about it from a team aspect rather than going okay I want to go to nationals and finish in the top four because we don't even know if nationals is going to happen but what you can control is the person that you become so you know having that kind of mindset has really helped me um because it's just a little bit more manageable in really uncertain times. Uh, yeah, Felix asks, what do you do if you contain an offender and they keep punishing you with the things that you decide to give them? 
Um, my tip for that is you probably just lose the game. Um, if they're if they're better than you and you actually can't do anything and they're just dominating you, then um, you you should well okay. Serious answer: you should either switch to someone who's going to do a better job, or if you are the person who is going to do the best job, um, then just do your best to to limit the damage. Um, but like if someone is better than just everyone on your team, then like you kind of just lose i think um maybe you you plead for them to to um, you you plead for your captains to play zone or something um but i think it's uh like like roop said defense goes on between the ears um you need to think about how you're gonna stop the bleeding or at least limit the bleeding so just trying to take away the the biggest thing and that might be um if if they only go deep when a certain hooker has the disc, just like recognizing that. Um, so then if a weaker thrower has the disc, then maybe you are able to challenge those unders. So it's a lot of like thought. Uh, Roops, you got thoughts on containing an offender? Um, just sometimes it's really hard. Like I remember being told, okay, you're going to mark the Cardenas twins. And I was just like, well, I can try. Um, so, you know, sometimes you just have to give credit to the person you're playing against and just respect the player that they are and just take it as a challenge you know sometimes you are just going to lose a battle but you know cha- challenge yourself to take it on and just enjoy the process because there's always going to be somebody that's better than you at something um and yeah sometimes you just got to give kudos uh yeah willem asks beyond game situation for example being behind are there things within the matchup itself which affect your decision to bait versus block, Rupal? Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to think about how to phrase this. So sometimes you have a matchup that you really just want to get a block on them. And then, so you. Like you have a personal matchup and you're like, okay, I want to get a block on this person's ability to do X. So I'm just going to give you an example. 2019 U24 Worlds, we played Germany in probably the saddest game of my life. I cried on pitch Um, and I was marking up against one of the girls and she's an incredible player, but she just, she was just so in my head at the time. Um, So I was like, okay, I need to get, like, I just need to snap out of it. Like, we were, I think we were maybe level at this point, but she was so in my head. I was like, I need to do something to make me feel better. Um, so I was like, I've just got to go and get a block on her. And then I will snap out of that zone. Um, so, yeah, I think mostly it's game situational. But if you feel like you need to get back in the game by doing something, that's also okay. But, like, people on your team need to know that. Like, it's it's okay to turn around to someone and go, I'm not enjoying this matchup or in this matchup to make myself, you know, get in it a bit more. I need to go and get a block. Even if you're like 10-2 up, but you think, I just need to do something to get myself back in the game. And if doing that is is getting a block safely, then um then do it. And sometimes, you know, people appreciate getting blocks. You know, it makes it might make the game go a bit quicker or it might pick up the pace and Sometimes, you know, you might say we're going to go for five containment um, moves on defense and then we're going to go for a block. And having a strategy, whether you're up or whether you're down, regardless, um, affects that decision as well. But, yeah, it depends on you. If you feel like I need to do something to get myself out of this rut, then um, go for it. Yeah, I think um, I I rely a lot on reading a player and... um seeing like is there an athletic matchup um do i think they're faster than me and which you can kind of measure throughout a point um or are they smart like if i just try and poach off them are they going to react to that um so that means that if you just try and go for a hero poach or flash in the lane somewhere are they going to punish you for it and if the answer is yes then like stick with them um otherwise then um, do stuff or are they predictable like a lot of um the callahan um from before was quite a predictable move um so if you just know what's going to happen ahead of time then um 
that's when you can use that to your advantage. Um, like if if you know that you're faster than someone and you know that they're about to fake deep and run under, then don't follow them that hard um, at the start of the undercut and then you're accelerating and then boom, you're getting a block. Uh, Redford asks, what are the best drills, either solo or pairs, for defensive footwork? Definitely over to you, Rupal. <laughs> um, ladders, so valuable. Even if you don't have a ladder, like it's been it's been hard in winter to like get out onto a field, but if you can find somewhere with like square tiles, then you can just imagine a ladder in your head. But you can Google loads and loads of ladder drills for footwork and finding like um, NFL drills are really good because they've got some really sweet footwork um and kind of just looking at that and trying to not just do it quickly but do it effectively so generate power um learn about how you generate power in your like in your body um will help with those drills as well because you don't just want to fly through a ladder quickly if you're not you know picking your knees up if you're not properly swiveling your hips over and things like that so there's so much that ties into defensive footwork and a lot of that just comes from going out and grinding and doing the things that make you look a little bit stupid like taking a ladder to the park and just by yourself in the middle of a field doing it but putting those reps in really pays off and as well as that another drill which I absolutely love at the moment is the 5-10-5 you just set up cones so you've got three cones five meters apart so there's five meters between each cone um, in a line start in the middle sprint out to one side that's five meters turn 10 meters to the furthest one and then five back into the middle and if you think about how a cutter would move they will probably make one two changes of directions so there you've got two changes of direction over different distances um, so that one's really good as well but you can just google them but different things that tie into footwork are obviously the footwork itself and being able to change direction with power effectively. And there are there are loads of things online that you can find about that. But, you know, practice the crossover steps, practice the ladders, practice generating power. Just go out and grind and just do it over and over and over again. And when you step back on pitch, you'll really feel the difference because it will just become so much more natural. What RuPaul said, ladder reacts only. Um... <laughs> Tips for freshers still new to the sport, says Kyle G. Um, my tip for freshers still new to the sport is go to practice whenever it is on. I, When I was at uni in my first year, I was a bad flake. When it rained, I didn't go to practice. When I didn't feel like it, um, I didn't go to practice. Sometimes I had other societies and I went to other societies. What was I thinking? Um, I recommend like really leaning into the sport and particularly like at uni, take every opportunity to get reps, like go to as many tournaments, play as many games as possible. And just like accept that a lot, like if you're, if you're a complete newbie, most of this talk has probably just like whizzed over your head um, because a lot of the concepts haven't been bedded in yet. Um, and like, that's fine. Just like get to get to terms with that. Um, and it's okay to ask for things to be explained um, at like a, a level that you understand uh, because it takes a while for like these ideas to to bed in and for you to figure out what's happening. Um, so just like be at peace with like your newbie status um, and just work hard to, um, to get good kid. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, I think one thing as well is like find someone who will happily just mentor you. Like, quite a lot of the time there is just that one person who just who just gets you right like find somebody else who was really keen when they started and who was stuck with it and just say like what did you do to get good you know three four years at uni maybe more I don't know PhD masters it's such a long time to improve definitely because you'll be playing hopefully soon you'll be playing ultimate so often that there's such a good opportunity to just practice 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 so find somebody who's happy to mentor you and just go to everything like just enjoy it whether that's like practices or the nights out or the socials just fully dive into it because it is super cheesy but it is just like a little community that you just get sucked into mm. Iona asks do you have any tips for getting involved in frisbee after graduation 
um i'd say just be proactive find out what there is um out there and if there isn't anything then try and make it happen because ultimate needs more organizers um and people are just like we're gonna play threes and it's gonna be sick and there are good threes variations as well if you can't get um, people around there or like just suck it up and travel somewhere to practice you know american american teams will pretty standardly travel like three hours for weekend practice like every weekend like it ain't no thing um and we're so much like more ugh, about that in the uk maybe because our roads are a bit more twisty turny um but yeah like it can be a bit more difficult um so you've just got to be more proactive and just be up for the for maybe getting on the struggle bus um what tips would you give to someone who would like to aim to play at a high level? Uh, Rupal? Yeah. Um, I think the main thing is, is just you've got to be willing to work. Like nothing gets handed on a plate and the people who do make it to like GB or like top of A tour you go to Euros, like they have put in an absolute shift. So if you are serious about like wanting to play high level, it's just fully embrace it. Like I'm not saying it has to take over your life, but it's it's definitely a lifestyle because it, it's an absolute process to even just identifying that you want to play at high level it takes so much like inner determination of going, I really want to do this. And then working towards it so make sure you hit the weights make sure you go out and do running make sure you get out and throw make sure you I'm not going to say think about ultimate all the time but make sure you kind of have that mindset of I know this is what I want to aim for um so who is going to help me to get there and what is going to help me get there you know reach out to people who have achieved what you want to achieve and and ask them how they did it and you know pick pick somebody go okay if I want to play U24 mixed so and so has played it how did they do it how did they find it what tips can I learn and you know what process did they take but you've got to fully embrace like if I'm going to do this I'm going to do it well because it is competitive you you go to trials and you see how many people turn up and you go okay everybody here has done has decided that they want to do it so everybody here has done something to get here but what am I going to do to help me stand out yeah um i think absolutely like asking for support and like trying to to get there and asking other people people love talking about themselves so like ask away and they'll defo um, tell you i think uh the biggest barrier to entry is like um you've got to think of to play at a high level um your entry ticket is a certain level of athleticism um and if you cannot run fast um essentially you are not gonna do very well at high level because like it underpins like getting free playing defense well if you are much slower than everyone around you you've either got to be godlike at some other state or what's more likely is like you're just not going to be in a position to thrive so everyone is out here on the grind doing the work um just for that to be at that base level of athleticism and people who can like really work hard um and um yeah put in the work um can can get to get to the higher level so you, you need like that that baseline athleticism before you can even think about um the rest of it um it's either that or like max out um throwing skills probably because if you can pull like 90 meters then maybe you'll maybe you'll be okay yeah um, but the one thing is like don't don't let that put you off because it's so it's such a reward like even if you don't make a team if you go like if that's your aim it doesn't matter you're in a far better place than you were beforehand so don't let any of that hard work put you off it because it is 100 percent worth it just just going through the process is worth it yeah yeah i'm not a naturally athletic person and i managed to get onto some some good teams by um just working hard um, and getting there and it was absolutely worth it uh, Willem, 
gone for a second question. It doesn't apply to the uni students, but assuming you both have full-time jobs, what kind of training, throwing slash running wise, do you do in the winter months when it's dark and freezing before slash after work? Rupal, what have you been up to? Oh, I've been up to loads. Um, so, yes, I have a full-time job. Um, what kind of training? So, I'm going to put my hands up now. I haven't done very much throwing, but I cannot wait to throw more now that it's getting brighter. And it is really hard because, as you said, it's dark and it's cold. But there are things that you can do indoors when it's dark and cold. And part of that is just working on your movement quality, like things like your mobility, like your flexibility, just strength and conditioning. There's so much you can do with just resistance bands and like two pints of milk that will help with your mobility and your stretching and everything like that so what I've done a lot of is just trying to reset my body and iron out the niggles and make like all the little tendons and all that kind of stuff stronger so that when you can run more like out on a field or when you can get out and throw more you just don't get injured um And that's actually really valuable. Like when I was younger, I got injured all the time because I just didn't take care of my body. And now when it's dark and cold, you have the ability to do that indoors. Um, And yeah, in terms of running, I just find a really small patch and just do sprints because, uh, yeah, that's all you can really do when it's frosty. But that's okay. Just take the time to like reset your body. And then when it does get brighter and there's more sunlight, you can get out and be injury free when you train. Mm. I've been doing indoor workouts Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then longer outdoor things at the weekend because that's when it's light um, and that's when you go outside. Um, yeah. Sick. So unless no one else has any more questions... Oh, here we go. What is it like in your experience transitioning from uni to club to international? Um, well, uni, I wasn't very good. So transitioning to club was good because that meant getting exposed to better players who at the time I thought were literal gods um, and I stole lots of training things from them um, because one of them um, one of the captains was uh, one of the captains ended up coaching GB Mix Um, so he he had a lot of cool training ideas that I stole Um, so club was really useful in being like look there's lots of people out there who can also throw flicks Um, so that was that was cool and then um i only really like applied to do under 23s because i went to like um a a training camp um and there were other people there who were kind of my age and they were like oh i'm going to play for germany under 23 or i'm going to play for netherlands and i was like whoa i want international kit um and so that was like the motivating thing for me just like um yeah i was just like I'm just going to make this happen. I'm going to work for it and uh, let's see what happens. Um, my, I had a very foolish method of maths, which was like, there, there were like a um, hundred, no, there were like 150 people at trials. No, less than that. There weren't lots of people at trials, basically. I was like, okay, so there's like a hundred people here and like 25 people are going to make it. So I need to be better than one other person because then that's like, two to one and then I make it and they don't so that, that I was like I just got to be a tiny bit better than people around me and and then I've made it um and that was it really just like always looking to get better and not being afraid to put in the work and then um also getting a little bit lucky um has yeah really like pulled it together uh roots yeah um kind of weird because uh I think for me, because international came before I went to uni, like through under 17s and under 20s, um, it was kind of weird. But with uni, I learned so much, like so much about Ultimate that I'd almost missed out on because of doing international. Like 
I'd never really had like a group of people that I was sort of just mates with because we loved playing frisbee together. It always sort of felt like a duty. So uh, uni was super enjoyable. And then from that, I kind of learned to love frisbee again, um, which was really nice. Sorry, Dan, I can see you're typing, but yeah, I did enjoy school frisbee. Don't worry about that. Um, and then with club, that is kind of where I felt I could push myself. So I found club the hardest because you're kind of taking a step from uni where you're almost in a comfortable environment. Um, and then you're going and playing with people, as Callum said, who are just so much like better than you. But you learn so much there. And then with international, it's just about, I think almost there you have to go, I've achieved what I want to achieve and now I've just got to go and enjoy it. And if you don't enjoy any of those elements, but particularly the international part, then you don't get a chance to sort of appreciate the people that have helped you along the way and also how far you've come. Um, so yeah, super enjoyed uni. And then club was like a massive learning curve. Um, and kind of like a shock to the system. And then international was just so fun because you see people that you've literally idled when you watch play ultimate. Like the first time I saw Jesse Schofner, I literally like was gobsmacked because I just couldn't believe I was actually playing against her. So you've just got to enjoy it. Yeah. And also like people who play for international teams that like really like Frisbee. So you really like among your own people. <laughs> Everyone's a bit desk. Oh, I actually didn't know who she was until somebody told me and she wrecked me, like, really badly. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, any more questions? There's lots of people typing. <laughs> Favourite meme? <laughs> it's got to be the one I featured in. But then, you know, I still don't know my left from my right, so I do that too. Uh, I do not have a favourite bear ulti meme. Sorry. I don't now want to appear on the bears memes thing. <laughs> You definitely will be doing now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> uh, that sounded like all of the questions. I don't know if you guys have anything else to say. Um... Uh, the uni team that I started with my friends, um, yeah, the my uni friends team won nationals in 2019. So, like, it's not that hard if you just get a lot of disc people together and just see what happens. So, LED are probably going to win in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me, I just really hope you guys can get back to playing Frisbee soon because it's such a shame. But, yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm sure everyone has learned so much about different types of defense. I'm sure I did. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everybody also for asking so many insightful and interesting questions as well. And thanks for answering all of them, um, as well. So yeah, I guess.